Welcome everyone. You are at the PCMA Convening Leaders 21. I'm really excited to be part of this. Uh, the Digital uh, Experience Institute is absolutely fabulous. You know, one thing about 2020, it has allowed us to really be engaged virtually. I think sometimes we forget that we could have done this. You know, we are you know, human beings. We want to be naturally in front of one another, networking, taking part, introducing, meeting new people. We'll talk as well with uh, uh, Ori Lahav about lead generation and how you do that virtually. So, you know, without further ado, let me welcome my guest for the Digital Experience Institute, Ori Lahav. He is the Vice President of Client and Operations for the Kines Group, as well as President of the International Association of Professional Congress Organizers. Welcome, Ori. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely excited to be able to interview you. This is going to be great um, because a lot of people, again, are getting into being virtual, you know, and, you know, stumbling their way through uh, as they do it as well, too. So, you know, let's get a chance for you to dive into this wonderful survey that you all took part in and some of the information that came out of it as well. And then we'll go into chatting about it, too. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Um, again, thank you for inviting me for the PCMA Convenient Leader although virtually. Uh, but uh, as, as you mentioned, we have uh, in Kenneth conducted two major surveys for two different audiences that have experienced virtual events. One is the HCPs, the healthcare professionals, and the industry support, which is very important for those meetings. So I'm just going to share the highlights of those uh, outcomes of the survey because I, th I think that you can find them uh, very interesting. And I'm, I'm a true believer that, that there's no future without history. So we re really need to know what was the experience of the different audiences in our virtual events in order for us to better plan for the future? Future could be 2021, maybe longer uh, for future virtual events or future hybrid events. Uh, but we all know that the, the virtual here is here to stay even in the future of the in-person meeting. So it's better for us to better understand. So I'll start with the um, HCP survey. Uh, so we have uh, reached out to uh, healthcare professionals that have participated in the virtual event. And as you can see from the profile, we have over 800 people that answered our survey from 111 countries. So truly, truly globally. And as you can see, 56% uh, are between the age of 35 to 54, which makes sense because this is the majority of people who anyhow uh, participate in those kind of association events. Um, so 92% selected content as their top factor when deciding if to attend a virtual event, followed by the availability of the content, meaning on demand and the, and the option to, to view the uh, content after, maybe before and after the event itself. And not less important is the reputation of the educational provider. Um, and when we ask them what activities can enhance the learning, you can see here different elements of, of education. So you can see here webinars, you can see e-learning e uh, courses, emerging topics. So different acti educational activities and not the regular plenary sessions and so forth. So different formats of uh, educational activity. And when the, we try to summarize what would be the ideal event for them, you can see the different element by length, by platform activities and content. And I'll start from the left side of the length. Um, so they, you, the majority of the people cannot stay for a whole day uh, uh, during the virtual event. So per, maybe half days, over three or four days, uh, lectures no longer than two hours, I would say not longer than an hour. Um, going down content, content is still the key and we'll discuss this probably further on. Uh, high quality content, activities as we see, different activities, webinar, e-learning, debates, panel discussion, micro-learning, simulation, uh, live demonstration, even virtually. And of course the platform should be interactive, easy to use and open for months. So people can still uh, uh, you know, get a chance to view all the content. So that's, summarize very quickly the HCP's views. And now I'm gonna to jump to the industry. So you can see we have uh, got answers from 150 industry professionals from pharmaceutical, medical device company, biotech companies, and so forth. And uh, again, I'm highlighting some of the questions that I think are gonna be relevant for our discussion. 
First of all, do you see virtual events replacing face-to-face -face meetings in the future? Only 10% said yes. And you can see the 65% said to some extent. So the, the, the companies, the industry support is not in the big favor of continuing the, in the virtual meetings. And what about their financial support for the events? As you can see that the majority of our 80% said that the support, the financial support will be and is lower than the face-to-face in-person meeting. And that's of course a concern to many of the association that have still planned to conduct their 2021 meeting virtually. And when we ask them, what are the main objective to attend a virtual meeting? Uh, so the first two priority for them was building brand awareness, which is great. I think this is the right direction they need to take and collecting new leads. Of course, this is a sales opportunity for them. Um, and what is the metrics or what is the data that they would like to receive after the virtual events? Of course, it makes a lot of sense. How many people visited their booth? document and download and visitor to their symposium. That's, uh, let's say, the first three places. And how do you measure success in a virtual event? And here I see one of the big issues we can discuss further on because they still measure success in the old way. Number of, visit, number of neat leads and number of visits. And in the virtual space, uh, it has to be different because the engagement level is different, the activities are diff different, and they cannot still continue to measure their success in the old fashioned way. Um, so if I try to summarize what we've seen in those two surveys, if, if, in, if today or in the past we had three major activities, we have the in-person meeting, now we have also the virtual conferences, and we used to have e-learning component in many of the, those meetings or association. Now, actually, when we combine those three together, we're going to move to something that is more of a lifelong learning in the digital engagement environment that will create um, communities in the future. So this is my summary for the highlights of uh, those two surveys. Well done. I mean, it's a really great survey. I got a chance to peek into the survey that other people haven't seen the entire thing. And, you know, it is the response is really interesting. I mean, one that was stuck out to me and we talked offline about it a little bit was the, you know, the virtual booths, the booths and, and, and that whole thing of how people are networking and really um, not knowing, I guess, how to use the space in that way, I guess you would say. Um, I think people are probably, again, when I say kind of fumbling through, what is the best way to use that, you know? Um, it's something we definitely want to talk about. So, so let's let's kind of start with that. Uh, the, or So how can uh, a, a virtual event, you know, as an attendee, how can you take advantage of in-person lead generation and networking? So what's your advice for that? And what are you com what's walking away with the information you're receiving from your, your members as well too. I mean, first of all, I would say that our role as industry profession, industry professional is helping educating our audiences because for the, the majority of the people is the first time experience in the virtual space. So we need to prepare them well enough in advance of how to make the most out of their experience. How, to, from, from the basic, start from the basic, how to log in to a virtual meeting, uh, how do I create my profile, how do I see the session? Uh, how do I engage with people? How do I network with people? So uh, that's one thing, as that's a lot of a marketing kind of role to get a lot of how to. The second thing is that we need to allow them to create their virtual profile in the best way we can. Allow them from, you know, of course, uploading their picture, but also creating the profile and allowing for kind of a business matchmaking solution in the virtual platform. Because in the end of the day, they would like to meet people that are interested for them. So if you can find a way, and there's a lot of solutions out there that build your profile and PCMA have used it for, for years now, uh, like brain dates uh, uh, from E180, um, that will allow them to meet people even in the virtual space, but a, a meeting that will be successful them, for them. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, allow them to uh, have enough time beforehand to log into the system, create a profile, even see some of the on-demand session beforehand and to join the live Q&A part. 
Uh, so this this is, I think, and of course, it, we need as again and as the people who are creating uh, those plat virtual platform to maximize the engagement between the supporters and the audiences. So it's very similar to if you talk about something like a LinkedIn, you know, you, you got to set yourself up to kind of receive uh, people, you know, for people to know who you are and what you're looking for. And then you have to participate um, is what you're saying as well, too. So it's no different than that. Correct? Yeah. I mean, it's not very different. If we could have somehow integrated the world of LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, for networking into our virtual space, I, that would be excellent because anyhow, the people that will be there are people that, you know, we have you know, shared interest in a way. Uh, but if I can even maximize that in a way that, let's say that we are both interested in this specific area in the medical field, but we also both of us like sports, right? Uh, football or baseball, then we'll have a lot of uh, common uh, and shared things to discuss, of course. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, I mean, it, it goes back to two. You you kind of meet people demographically, but then you also meet them psychographically. So exactly. psychographically with the fact that you do enjoy football or baseball or golf or even knitting. I mean, you know, it may be something <laughs> yeah, like absolutely. that as well, too, you know. And so you kind of find the community within by the way that you set, you know, the profile up as well, too. And, and I think you said that one of the key words, which is communities. Because what the virtual events will eventually create is communities. Because, you know, we're going to go back hopefully soon to in-person meeting. But I think that we all learned uh, through this pandemic that education can be done in a virtual space. Uh, so uh, we're going to still continue uh, learning through an online platform, whatever this platform will be, could be a virtual meeting. And then the in-person meeting might turn to something more or not just education, but more for the meetup, the networking part, and the, and the creating of communities. Yeah, and I think that's probably where some of the hesitation lies for people is, you know, am I going to lose this sense of community? You know, I look forward to going to this conference or whatever, and I see people that I may not be in contact with throughout the year as much, but... I know that I'm going to see them there, you know, and can I continue to connect with them in that particular way, you know, as well. So, yeah, but but you said you can. So and then it has a build. I mean, it's only been a lot of people have only been in this space less than nine months, you know, so they're still trying to get adjusted to it, you know, um, and, and that's going to take a little bit of time for some, even though we're moving really fast. Too fast to my, I mean, yeah, I, I know, agree. everything happened too, too fast. And if you look at yeah. the social revolution that this, you know, society has, has been through from, you know, engineering to computer, computing uh, revolution, it all took around a hundred years. Of mm -hmm. course, it takes now shorter times to move from one revolution to another. So it wasn't the real revolution it was kind of an evolution, but what we have all faced here with this pandemic it's, it was a quick, maybe too quick uh, revolution. And that's why I think that looking, you know, for the uh, near future, I think there will be a little bit uh, going backwards, a little bit reverse, uh, revert, maybe reverse engineering in a way. Um, so we'll, 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 we took it too fast, too high to, to the virtual space. So, of course, we will need the in-person again. Yeah, absolutely. So then that goes to the question really about the hybrid. So is 2021 the year of hybrid or not? Because I hear people in the event world, they're hoping for it, for sure. But um, what's your feedback on that? <laughs> that's, a, that's a million dollar question, of course. And I think there's too many unknowns right now, uh, especially when we're looking at 2021. Uh, with, with, with vaccine is, is out there, which is very, you know, we, we see the light at the end of the tunnel, of course, everybody uh, but we don't know what kind of uh, restriction we're going to still have and what, you know, if we will be able to travel like we did in the past. But the hybrid um, actually present a, another challenge, which is a financial challenge. Because uh, think, of a, think of an event who, who draws uh, around 4,000 people on an annual basis, right? And when they turn virtually, they might have even had 6,000 people because people would, you know, can join easily. And now... Uh, they want to go to hybrid events. What happens if the uh, ratio between between the the audiences will be twenty percent in person and eighty percent 
virtually or 50-50 or uh, you know, 80-20? When is this tipping point that you know that will be financial viable to do it both in person and virtual? Because in the hybrid world, you have actually two major expenses. You still have the, the, the production on site and you still have the production online. And then will you have enough money to, to afford it. And that, I, I, you know, talking to our clients and the association, that they're one of the biggest challenges for us and for them, the biggest challenge is moving forward. Um, but, you know, if I go back to your, your question, yes, I mean, hybrid will be there, but I don't know exactly when and how, uh, but for sure we will have to allow people to join virtually to the in-person meetings. Yeah, I think so. I think that, that hybrid, I'm like you, I don't know when, but, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think you're going to be able to leave out the virtual because there will be people again. I think cost is a huge factor um, in it as well, because a lot of people have grown and they've reached places that they couldn't reach before. You know, so if they were you know, situated in one country or one, you know, on this uh, particular continent and they were now they got people coming from all over who didn't even know that this this particular event existed you know um you you start to bring them in and house them in and can they even get there you know and then if they do can you like you said go from three thousand to six thousand people you know um i had a concert this summer that went from eighteen thousand to forty two thousand because we did virtually we can't accommodate those people if they come into the space you know so we have to keep the virtual part of it just because we put it out there we now have to maintain it in some way you know so hybrid will be there absolutely and then i think we also have to change our mindset of how we produce those events true so I, I i take into you know a good example for me is the olympics olympics that's going to be happening hopefully this year right the one who was postponed when i watch the of course there's a different experience of being there at the stadium you know watching the marathon runners coming into the stadium and so forth so and that's one experience but also watching it on tv is a different experience and how do you take this uh, this production uh, to our virtual events world? So how can I transmit this at, you know stadium atmosphere to the people at home so they feel also engaged uh, to what's happening in the in-person meeting? Yeah, and, and and the Olympics is a good one. You know, a lot of people travel to see it, but then the other side of it is, you know, we can watch it on TV. You know, um, when we can't be there, you know, so the, you know, the expansion of it in that particular way um, as well. But, you know, let's go back and just just briefly tell us what does the Kenis Group do? Okay, so Kenis Group is a global PCO. Uh, the company was founded in 1965 already uh, by Gideon Rivlin, who was a real uh, pioneer and an entrepreneur. Uh, started uh, as a local PCO in Israel and uh, started to invite international meetings. So he got a good connection with, with you know, KOL's leaders in, in the medical field and say, why don't we invite the international conference to Israel? Uh, which was very successful in the beginning. And at a certain point in the late 19th, they decided to go globally as well. They opened offices worldwide. Uh, worldwide and uh, also bought a few companies. Now we have around 17 offices around the globe, more than 350 employees. Uh, we do around 100 plus minus 100 events uh, per year um, uh, on a group level. Um, and I guess that 80% of our business is medical life science, science uh, field. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, because I realized I said, do we did did people can read, but it's always good to hear from you <laughs> on what you do. So, so let's talk about these five areas needed for an ideal virtual event. And and you know they are you highlighted them a little bit, but they're very yes. extensive um, mm -hmm. in the information you sent me. So you know name the five areas needed for an ideal virtual event. Okay, so I'll I'll start with the. Uh, you know, program design, we have spoken a lot about meeting design in the past. So I think that this is even more relevant in the virtual space. So when I speak about uh, program design, there's a few areas. First of all, the length of the meeting. Uh, usually a Congress is uh, conference is two, three days. Uh, maybe it has to be longer on the days, but shorter per day. So maybe five, six days, but only four to six hours per day. So that's the Kind of program design high level and then when you go deeper then about the session formats they have to be shorter they have to be more interactive uh different styles of sessions now you know not long you know nobody will 
sit in front of the computer to see a plenary session for two hours. It's not, it's not gonna happen. Um, and then we have maybe uh, 20 to 20 to 40 or 45 minutes per session, more panel discussion, more uh, interactive voting and polling and quizzes and, and treasure hunt and whatever keeps the audience engaged. So that's about the session type. Uh, the three, I would say, we touched about it, the pre-access to the platform to, you know, for people to get familiarized with the, with the, with the virtual platform because there's so many out there, you know, more or less there are similar, but you still have to, and the, the ability to create your profile and start uh, maybe uh, uh, meeting other people, uh, maybe watching part of the uh, on-demand video beforehand and then just joining the Q&A part. Um, number four would be how easy the platform is. And since uh, I, there's hundreds of platforms there, so you have to find the one who uh, matches your needs because every, every event is different. Um, so how could you find the platform that you know, matches the, your audiences and the, 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 the association or corporate or client, whoever is uh, conducting this meeting? And uh, I would say five, maybe it's the most important part that I kept it, left it for the last one is the quality of the content. And, uh, you know, content is still the, key, the king. And uh, I mean, in our previous discussion that I said, this is what's great about PCMA, all the preparation that is done uh, before the convening leader conference, even when we did it in person um, and how we prepare for this session, this is what makes it, uh, uh, you know, quality content for people to, to view. Yeah, and that's the thing about content. I was like, you know, even in research and in looking, it's, you know, it still uses the term of content is king. I mean, nothing has changed with that because, and now that people have to sit, you know, and watch, you know, it has to be engaging and there's so much out there now. You know, particularly in 2020, people, you know, tripled it up, I think, yeah. on the amount of content that you now have access to. You know, it has to be something that's going to, you know, really engage people. So even, you know, there was a quote that was in what you said. It said, content remains the king, but delivery is now reigning queen. Explain. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we all speak about the Zoom fatigue, right? We, you know, it's a new terminology, yeah. but we never said there's a, Netflix fatigue, right? That's why so that? true. <laughs> <laughs> what, why is that? Because the uh, way the content is delivered, right? Uh, of course, well, we, we, I, you know, it's it's uh, comparing apples to oranges. I know that, but there's still something about the fact that we can sit there and and watch Netflix for hours and, and binge through a lot of great series, but when we sit and see a virtual meeting with very good content it's still different so going back to our mindset as 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 you know industry professional pcos meeting planners uh we need to change our mindset to more of a tv production style of things and how we uh, bring the content to the audiences so this is the queen this is how we deliver the content so again going back to the format of the session and how we deliver them and also uh, the fact that we need to, and we spoke about earlier about educating uh, the uh, the market, it's also about how we educate the speakers. Uh, you know, we see, of course, there's a there was a huge learning curve in the last couple of months. But you know, speakers that, and I've and I've seen recorders recording of speakers that they have they're used to stand on a you know next to a podium speak to an audience you know see reactions and, he, and now they sit in front of a camera in front of a, a monitor and it's very difficult for them so how do we help them support them and uh, educate them and help them to convert the message in the best way in the virtual world yeah and i mean even like you said it's apples to oranges with netflix but <laughs> the the thing is is the quality um, and initially when we started in the pandemic, uh, someone said to me, they was like, you know, people, they were in the TV side. It was like, woo, people are really letting the quality go. He, they were like, you know, we're going to give them that for a little bit, but that's not going to last for long. He said, cause people are going to look eventually be like, and they'll start picking it out because they'll get more, uh, you know, an introduction and more accustomed to seeing certain things. And even as meeting planners as well, too. Uh, knowing that you're going to need a virtual team 
production yep. wise to be able to pull things off, you know, that you may have not known you needed before. Um, it's not a matter of, again, just getting on a Zoom and just pressing a button, you know, especially if you want to stream out or do anything like that, your quality is going to be, particularly, again, we're now nine months in and people expectations are going to increase. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. I mean, the, the first virtual Congress we did uh, was in the first week of April. So we were supposed to be in Vienna for one of our conferences and three weeks before the conference, when everything started in, in Europe, uh, we had three weeks to uh, pivot a, a, a conference from in person to virtual. And of course, this first meeting versus the one we ended uh, a couple of weeks ago in the uh, first week of December are uh, completely different. I mean, maybe not completely, but they're very different. We have learned so much when we're doing things diff differently. But it also goes back to the to uh, the skill set that we need now, or the skills that we need in our teams. So a lot of uh, a lot of the burden has moved, shifted from the project manager, the meeting planner, to so the IT people and the AV people. Um, but you know, tomorrow morning, maybe every meeting planner needs to know how to edit a video. Uh, I mean, we, we have to take this time to upscale our teams for that. Yeah, definitely. I think that's what you know, maybe of some nervousness <laughs> to some people as well. <laughs> yeah, because the IT team was only involved. They were backup, you know, yeah. they weren't the major player in the yeah. structure, you know, of the organization when a meeting took place, you know, and that play were called when, you know, things didn't work, you know, not but being there from before the show opened in the sense of how it's run and how instruction and really having a say so. You know, so that is definitely a change uh, yeah. as well, too. So what are the top three activities um, to offer someone to increase uh, learning during virtual events? OK, activities to uh, enhance learning. Um, I would say I would say uh, good preparation in advance. So it's very important for us to well communicate uh, intersex expectation to uh, what's gonna be um, presented in the virtual meeting, um, how to get most, uh, what kind of sessions, where do you find things you're looking for? That's one thing. Um, the second thing is that people are learning by doing. That's, that's what we, you know, when I learned about meeting design, that was the, one of the first world rules that I learned. People learn by doing. So when, in our conferences, there's a lot of uh, on hands-on workshops and so forth. So we need to learn how to transmit this into virtual space, how we can allow a, also live demonstration uh, and, and, and doing together in the virtual space. And, and I will say that we also learn from other people. So we need to ensure that we uh, you know, allow those possibilities to people to break out in smaller rooms and enable their, their discussions as well. Though it's, it's difficult, it's not easy, but I've seen Congresses that, that have done many sessions that break out for smaller groups, discussion, go back to the main hall, present something. Uh, that's really great. People are enjoying that, people are participating, and this is how they also learn. Yeah, those are good. The small groups are becoming more popular um, yeah. more than anything. Um, initially, people had, you know, just this one large session, plenary yeah. session, and didn't know. Again, I, this, it goes back to the technology and the production side of it, how to move people around within the virtual space the same way they would if they were in person. So yeah, those are some things that I think we'll, we'll see more of, um, will be the breakout uh, terminology coming back, you know, when people are in virtual meetings as well too. So you, you mentioned this in the presentation you did before we started talking, um, but I think people, you know, it's always this, you know, trying to figure out what the length is, you know, and what's ideal um, for getting and keeping your audience engaged. So talk about that, the one, the two hours, the three hours, what is best to keep people engaged? And also just not to turn them off when they're starting to register or sign up by looking at the hour and the time. Yeah, I mean, when, when planning the, the, the virtual meeting, we also need to look at the time zone because, uh, you know, you've said that this is a great opportunity to increase the, the potential people that are attending a meeting. If they couldn't travel in the, in the past for the in-person meeting, now it's easy for them to join uh, virtually the, the, the meeting. And um, therefore we need to look first for times so that they can accommodate people from, from Asia to North America. 
So it's one of the challenges. And, the, and it also means that the, 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 you know, the length of, of per day should be shorter. Uh, I would say ideal between four to six hours, uh, stretching the conference in around five days, more or less. And people are looking for live sessions. I can tell you uh, when one of our clients shows that the majority of the content will be recorded in advance and only one or two sessions per day will be streamed live. We've got comments, you know, we, we run this uh, chat to technical support and we've got comments from people. Well, I did not sign up for a YouTube library. Uh, I, I paid good dollars to see a session and they want to see live sessions so they can interact and ask questions and so forth. Um, so I would say for those four to six hours per day have maximum, you know, all those hours, live sessions, live session, even in parallel, allow interactive with the audiences, have a live Q&A, ensure that you have enough time for Q&A for the audience. And, you know, in between, there's a lot of content can, that can be stored in on demand uh, that are not the live part, which is great because people can consume it whenever they want. Um, for me, that, and of course, the session uh, has to be shorter uh, and more engaging, yeah. Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the planning sense, you know, people, like we said, the zoomed out or the fatigued out from the virtual events now, they've died down a little bit. You know, people aren't, uh, I think, as um, bombarded as they were before. Again, because it was a mad rush to try to fix something, you know, to try to figure out what are we going to do when we had this planned and we don't want to, we're so far in, you know, that we can't just give it up or, or um, cancel it, you know, with some of them. So they made the, the shift, I guess you would say. And so it was a lot coming at people of things that they needed to attend or would have attended in the same type of format is what I'm saying. Yeah. And, yeah. and I will also add, you know, have breaks between sessions. Yes. It's very important. Need a, you know, people need to stretch, you know, uh, move around a little bit. Uh, we also added some of what we call wellness sessions. So stretching, yoga nice. kind of things to allow people you know, fight this Zoom for thick, as we said, um, and and we, and we were had to fight with clients to uh, convince them that you know people need break between sessions. Don't do one session after the other. People, you know, give them their fifty minutes break so they can grab a coffee, drink water, whatever they do, uh, so they come fresh to the next session. Yeah, I'm, I'm a believer in the breaks. I mean, I want them when I'm in person, so why wouldn't I want them yeah. virtually? That's the way I look at it, too. <laughs> so nothing changes, you know, as, as far as the physical uh, of what is needed, you know, and just because people are in their homes or in their offices by themselves or whatever the case may be. So um, one of our, our, our last questions, I think, unless I come up with something else, and that could be, <laughs> <laughs> can converting virtual engagement into insights and data deliver sponsors and key stakeholders impact? Um, because it's really a, a, one of the big things too. So when you're seeking sponsorship or you got these key stakeholders who are already, maybe they're signed up for two to three year deal with you already. Can the virtual uh, engagement offer you the level of data and insights that you would from an in-person event? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have so much data we didn't have in the past. That's for sure. I mean, uh, we know so much that we didn't know in an in-person meeting. Even if you know, we know we spoke about sponsor, they have this exhibit booth. And of course, they scan the badge of those who visit that booth. But usually didn't have time to you know, catch up and speak with everybody just wander around the booth. Here we know exactly who visited when, which, what kind of content he wanted to see, which kind of, because they of course have the possibility to upload videos and brochures and product information. So uh, they see exactly what people are interested in. And also uh, when people join their, their sessions or what we call symposium session, the industry session, they know exactly uh, uh, not only the demographic, but how long did they stay in the session? Which are the, were the peak times? What was the most interesting content during their session? And this is this is valuable data for them that they didn't have in the past. So speaking about you know going back to the skills we need, uh, data mining uh, and uh, the ability to know how to um, get the insights over those data is also very very important. And I think that the, the, one of the challenges that we see 
uh, is that the sponsors and exhibitor are not, you know, their mindset, as we saw it in the surveys as well, is not there yet. They still measure success in the old way and they have to completely change their mindset. They have to work on brain awareness for sure, but they also have to work more on providing educational uh, content because this is what people are looking for and we said content is still the key. So make sure you, you bring content and not just measure how many people uh, visit the booth. They will come to the booth if you provide them good content and good educational content and stay in, in, in touch with them. They also have to change their mindset of being more proactive and approaching people because one of the challenges for them uh, when they look at the, about the return on investment is that they don't see everybody, you know, they don't see the people standing in their virtual booth. It's not tangible, right? Um, so yeah, they have to be proactive. You know, a lot of virtual platform allows to see exactly who currently is now in my uh, virtual booth. So, you know, be proactive, go with the, whatever chat service this platform provides and say, hi, my name is Orion from this and this company. Uh, would you be interested to uh, schedule a meeting and so forth? Um, and hopefully we'll see that in the future because again, I think they're not there, there yet. So let's close with this question and piggybacks off of what you said um, in, in answering that. So how do we make organizations understand? Um, and it's really based on a survey too and really the industry that you're talking about as well, but I think it impacts as, as a whole um, that virtual events will remain an important way um, of engaging their audience. So when we talked about the hybrid and we talked about we don't know what 2021 it would become, but I think that it's not going away um, in, that, in that sense. I think that when you talk about the brand um, awareness, even marketing, um, once you've done this and you've gained this audience that differences of seven hours away like you and I, I mean, <laughs> why not keep them, you know? So how do we make them understand that virtual events should become a part of, of their, of their platform, of their, of their organization as a whole? I mean, it's even bigger than that. First, first of all, I think the organization now realized more than in the past that learning can be done online, uh, w which is a great insight because now they realize that they continue education, not only as a one-off when they had their Congress or their conference. So the education will be a continuous effort along the year 365, lifelong learning experience, as I, as I mentioned. And in between, they will have the opportunity to have the in-person meeting, to bring people together and to give something else that you cannot achieve in an online world. If it's, if it's what we said, hands-on workshop, simulation, uh, networking, uh, even, you know, socializing with people. We are social animals. Uh, and, and we will look and focus more on those added values that an in-person meeting can offer uh, that an online world can't. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, you know, if you all are uh, just tuning in, you, you you missed a great conversation. I hope you're not just tuning in. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're here with uh, Ori Lahav. He is talking about delivering value to virtual sponsors here with the Digital Experience Institute. Um, so we're going to, in a minute, get an opportunity to take uh, live questions with everyone as well, too. We're excited to be able to do that. S you know, so get your questions ready, be able to probe, and he's here to answer those questions uh, as well. So again, you're at the PCMA Convening Leaders 21. Hey everybody, I'm enjoying you all's chat. You all got a lot of information in that chat. Are you checking out the chat, Ori? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> you couldn't give up the pace. I know, I'm trying to read them all at the same time. I'm like, okay, no, let me stay focused over here. <laughs> and that's let me give a that, that's, But that's how people network, and I saw that. That's the, exactly the, how, exactly. Uh, so I was like, see, people are using the chat the way we're talking over here. <laughs> okay. Welcome, and everybody. You, yeah. Happy New Year to you as well. Uh, thank you for being a part of this and staying tuned to us as well. You know, it was a lot of information and really some great information. So, Ori and I definitely want to get a chance to include you all in the conversation live as well, too. I'm going to give a thumbs up real quick to Teresa 
who said that I'm, you know, it's fading out with a production and bad quality. It's faded out for me. People need better quality production. It's not happening. 2021, they're like, get it together. Get it together in 2021. <laughs> so we're going to start with some of the questions that you all have um, posed to Ori. And, and one of the top ones is about recruiting sponsors in 2021 who've had a bad experience in mm. 2020. So what's your advice for that, Ori? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I think what we have experienced is that we have done uh, so many platform demos, I call it, because you want to bring confidence to your sponsors and exhibitors. Uh, they might have, the, as, you, as they mentioned, the bad experience, and you want to show them how different this experience is. So we have created uh, uh, ses demo sessions to all the exhibitors and sponsors. One after that, I think we have contacted already 400 uh, demos uh, to those sponsors. Give them confidence of the new platform that we are offering, maybe which is different than what they have experienced in the past. In addition, we have to prove them that they can still uh, get networking uh, opportunities. So okay. in our platform, the one we are using, the Kenneth one, they can really see who's in the booth, they can reach out, they can start the conversation, uh, which is very, very important for them. And we also encourage them uh, to to focus, as I mentioned before, brand awareness, bring good education. Good education is also uh, is always a winner. So I won't push them if they if they reject the idea of having a virtual booth. You know, I'm not going to fight all, all the way through. So you know, fine. But as long as you as you do your educational session, as long as you start the conversation with people, and they will slowly gain positive experience as well. Yeah. So, but in, and in the meantime, again, the biggest thing is people don't want to lose their sponsors. You know, they want to make sure that they have them, you know, around as well. Um, and I think one thing too, I, you know, I don't know if that was part of the losing, uh, but one thing she said is the no lead generation, I think was the biggest thing as well and ways to keep them and maintain them in that, that particular way. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, but it's offset by the data they get. So. Right. True. So they don't have the the uh, regular scanning of the badge when they see the people, but they will get the exact data. Of course, if people will approve and GDPR and everything, they will see who was in their booth. They get the information. They can reach out and follow up after the event. Uh, there's other opportunities, as I mentioned, also in their educational session, they will have more data than ever. And, and therefore, we just have to uh, again, help them, educate, support them. Uh, what are the pros versus the con, hybrid or virtual versus in, in person? And there was a lot of uh, talk in the chat about toolkits. I think someone's sending everybody a toolkit as well. But what, what do you think is the best way to guide exhibitors and sponsors um, to get the most out of their experience? We, we conduct a lot of rehearsals. Okay. Uh, so we divide it into two. Uh, regular sessions and let's say uh, plenary keynote speakers or the complicated uh, sessions. So for regular talks, uh, regular presentation, we uh, offer them a few slots for coming to rehearsal and then we give them tips on better presentation skills a little bit and also, you know, ensuring lights, uh, audio and so, you know, the regular things. Uh, but for the most more complicated session or the more important session with the keynote speakers or those who have voting or polling quizzes, we do a, a dry run, we do a rehearsal, specific rehearsal uh, for that session to ensure that it will go smoothly. Same we do with sponsors. For sponsors, it's a default. We do a dry run, we do a full rehearsal uh, with our tech guys, with the uh, program manager, program coordinator, and the account manager and all the people involved, again, bring them confidence that this will work flawlessly. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think the confidence just has to be there. And one person said yesterday during an um, interview I did, we were just saying, you know, sponsors also have to change their mind frame a little bit. You know, that, that things have shifted as well. Can't have the same expectations. Not that they, you know, can't elevate or have expectations. Let me say that but the expectations may change. And I think the delivery of information can be faster when we talk about data and insights. 
because mm -hmm. the thing about virtual, you get it fast. You get the information fast. I mean, even if you do on demand, you know, after something is live, you can then calculate those numbers too, which actually, you know, could be really good if you offer on demand after you have live events too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, most of our most of our clients also uh, leave the, the the platform open for additional three months or four, one month. Okay. So the the content uh, is still available for watching, and we we saw. I mean, I'm going back to the first conference we did in the first week of April, and when we analyzed the data three months after, we saw that 40% of the uh, of the content was actually watched after the days of the events. So it's it goes it's it's the same for the sponsors and the exhibitors. You know their information is there, their educational content is there. They can update it and refresh it from time to time, and they need to see the data not only for the days of the event. They will receive data on a monthly or a weekly basis, and people will still consume their content, uh, which is you know a big advantage versus an in-person meeting. Exactly. So, you know, one person had a question about gamification and when it doesn't work, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, what is something else that you could do, you know, when it doesn't work? I mean, there's not, not one size fits all. I, I don't want to force gamification on a person if he doesn't like. So I need to make ensure that I offer different things to different people. Uh, so if you have, like, we do have now the leaderboard, right? Right. It, it will speak to people who want to be leaders. Uh, if I have Jeopardy, those who are interested will join Jeopardy. And if I not, I'm just going to use the regular, uh, going to tune into the regular sessions. So have those all, all those opportunities, but don't force anybody to, to use them. Right. Yeah, because it doesn't work for everybody. I mean, it's yeah. different, you know, different. Act Again, your demo knowing your demographics and your psychographics, you can figure out because it isn't a, a, a end all for everybody. It's not a fix it. Thing. You know, you have to know that this is something that your audience is engaged in and they want it. And maybe sometimes you kind of sneak it in a little bit, <laughs> but don't give the whole, you know, the whole shebang may not be full of gamification at that time. People make it just get tired of it as well, you know, as a part of the content. Yeah, and we're not far of implementing AI across all our virtual Correct. media. Right. We'll recommend the content that is relevant for you. It's the same as we do for matchmaking. It's the same a logarithm that we have already the profiling of the, of the person we have already the previous data of well, what they watched what they've liked and we now can recommend content according to their needs which is you know in, increase their satisfaction and experience for uh the virtual meetings so going back one person was saying the rehearsals you were saying were for the sponsors and the exhibitors you were doing it for both yeah, we do it for for regular speakers, for for exhibitors, for sponsor exhibitors. We do a lot of of uh, in, in, uh, platform demos to ensure that they know exactly. You know, open this tab and in this tab, uh, open the always the chat, and you have the ability to speak with people. And again, bring the confidence and you know how to uh, work with the platforms. And for sponsors that has educational um, uh, sessions, of course, we do rehearsals. Yeah, and then and just a quick housekeeping for everybody. Yeah, the reset the session is re being recorded, so you will be able to go back and look back back over it as well too. Um, we a lot of people keep asking that question as well too. So yeah, thanks for the thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the questions was about um, looking at one people were asking about your survey. Is it going to be available? So the uh, ATP service is available on the chemist.com website. Okay. Uh, so you can download it from there. Uh, we're going to share the uh, industry one very soon. So you got the first uh, view, uh, especially for uh, uh, PCMA and VS. And uh, uh, so you're going to see it soon on the website. So follow the website. And I saw there was also a, demo a question about uh, the specialities of the healthcare professionals in this survey. So I quickly opened the survey uh, and we have a wide variety of specialities from psychiatry, pediatricians, diabetes, neurology, neuroscience, rheumatology, cardiology, internal medicine, nutrition, uh, veterinarians, uh, immunology. So it's really a broad picture of the ATPs. So people get a wide spectrum of, of yeah. the groups. And I've seen the whole survey. 
Thank you, Ori. <laughs> it's really great information. So you all should really go to it. It really is a it's a really great survey. Um, people, their responses are some of them are kind of like wow, you know, in the responses as well too. And we talked about that offline. So I would suggest that you look at the survey as well too. So one person mentioned it doesn't make sense to match uh, your registrants with your sponsors based on the questions how uh, they respond to questions, which I think is a really good question. Uh, if it makes sense or doesn't make sense, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it. I think it's for me. It makes a lot of sense. We also, it, in our registration process, we ask people if they are willing to share the content with the uh, supporters. So if you don't want to, you can. I mean, we said we don't want to force everybody, any, anyone, to do something that it is not uh, uh, doesn't like to do. So once it it, it, it he ticks the, the the person ticks the box. Of course, I think that uh, it's great to match between companies and doctors. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, it's a win-win for both if they want to. Perfect. So someone asked about the monetization too. You know, how do you monetize off of virtual events as well? I mean, for us, uh, until now, uh, the virtual events were, I mean, very successful because, of course, you don't have any uh the uh, production expenses of the venue av catering and so forth and there were obviously shifted to the production of the of the virtual one right. and sponsored most you know the majority of the sponsors stayed on board maybe not with the full amount but uh we're here it really depends on the congress it could drop to 80 percent 60 percent even 50 percent but it's still profitable because the expenses are lower uh, but I think that, again, if we spoke about changing mindset, we need to think of, um, of the long term. So don't look just at the income in the coming Congress. That's a, what I said. If, you, if, if uh, um, a company doesn't like to take a virtual boot, don't fight it. So, yeah, you might see lower incomes in the first event. But when they see it's a successful one, they will definitely want to be in the, in, in the next edition. So you, you need to think about the long term. The longer, uh, you know, viability or in this case of the association or their profit or the or if it's an organization or a corporate that uh, generate uh, revenues from those meeting. Uh, yeah, they will see uh, maybe a slight drop in the coming meeting, but uh, uh, hopefully they will see growth in the future. Um, and, and one other question, too, I think is good. Uh, Toda asked this to you about do you have any key elements for scientific medical staff meetings that have really helped to offer or deliver ROI for sponsors? Do you have any examples that you can offer or where she could go? I'm, I mean, I think that uh, the return on investment comes from, for, from the, for the sponsors come from mainly from a, a participants in their educational symposia or sessions, because this is the way they product their, the, you know, market their products. So we need to encourage people to visit with all the compliance complexity, but we need to help them market those sessions and ensure that have maximum people attending those sessions. Uh, and that's a great exposure for them. They're, they, they can see, of course, they get the data as well. So they see return on investment. And, and again, going back to all the data they can receive from uh, people visiting their booth and so forth. Actually, another thing we've, we've, we've uh, kind of uh, implementing right now in our, in our uh, platform is kind of a YouTube ads. You know, you can, okay, uh, with all the, again, the compliant complexity, and we need to ensure that we are compliant, that before you start, like we have seen before this session, a few advertising, uh, but let's see, let's think that I click on, I don't know, I want to go to uh, an auditorium, a virtual auditorium, but and, and I clicked on the menu, go to the virtual auditorium. Then it pops up a short video that I can skip after three, four, five seconds. Uh, really like YouTube. And that's an advert of a sponsor. Uh, this is something that we can offer that they didn't have in the past in virtual events. And it's very similar to the online world we are, we are all used to. Uh, but this is also uh, another example. And we have to be very creative in, in, in opportunities of exposure we give to our sponsors. I think, again, here in uh, conveniently, the PCMA does it in a great way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have one it, it kind of example, and I think it's a question too, but uh, 
taking a conference that you did two weeks ago, rewinding it, putting it back out again on your platform or repackaging it and selling pizzas of it, you know, as a virtual event later as well. I say do both, but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that uh, we spoken about life uh, learn, le learning and the fact that education doesn't stop after the conference and it's 365. So what do you do with the, you have great content stored. What do you do with that? How do you reach out to new audiences that uh, didn't have the chance to participate? And we continue to market conferences because again, the content is there for th usually for three more months. So we don't enter our marketing activities after the days of the events. The content, is, yeah, it's not live. It's per, it's recorded. It's uh, watched on demand, but it's still there. And in addition, there are some companies, uh, especially in the medical field, that knows how to um, sell it to uh, com pharmaceutical companies uh, or or sell access to the platform to their in their, um, let's say, country. So if you have a, an affiliate in Australia or in India, uh, he might buy access to the platform and, and give to 100 uh, doctors HCPs in, in their country. So it's, so it's an, an, another opportunity to sell, resell the content. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we we definitely going over time. <laughs> we <laughs> run out of time. So, we can continue. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. It's just it's just it's what it is. <laughs> thank you so much, Ori. I really appreciate your time. This has been excellent. You know, everyone. I thank you all for attending. You know, definitely look at the record as well too. Uh, it will be there on demand for you all. Continue to enjoy the Digital uh, Experience Institute. I'll see you all on the next one. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Karen. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take bye -bye. care.